All right, uh, welcome to CST8215. Um, today, at first, we're just going to go through some of the basic outlines of what the course is going to cover, and then we're going to dive into the first week's material. Um, first things first, I'll introduce myself properly. Um, I graduated from Canador College in 1996. Uh, it's been a few years. Um, did graduate with a computer programming and system analysis diploma, so, you know. I am working in the right field. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since. Teaching is my side gig. Um, my wife used to call it my hobby that pays. Um, so I work full time. I've been teaching for, actually that's almost wrong, almost 17 years now here at the college. Uh, teaching database uh, one way or another. Uh, Introduction to operating systems using Linux. I've also taught uh, web development. So I've covered a bit of that. Uh, I currently work for a company called Catlink Technology. Um, it's a division of a company called EFI, which you've probably never heard of, either of them, which is not a surprise because they are, they are both in very niche markets. Um, why is there a disclaimer on this now? Because the company I work for got bought out last July. So we were Catlink Technology Corp. Now we're just a division of. EFI. Um, there is actually a link to EFI here at the college. If ever you send anything to the print shop, all their printers are running EFI software. So it was, that was kind of a cute uh, discovery I did last summer. So the print shop at the school is run by the software of the company that owns the company I work for. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, but what do I do there? I'm a full stack web developer. Um, I do everything from setting up a web server all the way up to developing, planning uh, an, an entire application. Uh, I do this for our OEM customers, not for us directly, but our customers that give us money to do the work for them. Um, so I've, you know, been programming for a while. In, um, since 96, I've been un unemployed for a grand total of seven weeks. It's a good industry to get in, especially if you can find an employer you can stick with. I've been with Catholic for 22 years. So minus a two-year hiatus in the middle where I went somewhere else for two years and then went back. But I was still working for them anyways, contract work. So it is what it is. Um, so what kind of person am I? I tend to have a loose and easy going teaching style. Uh, you will notice that I don't have lecture notes per se. I have slide decks. The slide decks are there to remind me what I'm supposed to be talking about that day. Uh, I do this for a living. Therefore, the material is, you know, very well ingrained in my head. I'm not one of those people that went through academia for 10 years and then went to teach. I went through school for three years and then started to work. Um, I've been told I'm sarcastic. That can't be right, but apparently I am. Um, I do tend to understand that life happens. Uh, I understood that life happened even before COVID, and I understand life happens even more after COVID. Uh, but by the same token, I don't have any patience for people, I try to take advantage of that. So, you know, your dog peed on your laptop, congratulations, I'll believe you the first time. After the third laptop replacement, I'm going to start thinking maybe you should take out some puppy training. And I'm not going to have any more patience. So that's, you know, there's like a line there where I'll put up with a lot of dumb stuff, then suddenly, you know, you're now testing my level of beliefness. Um, I've also an equal opportunity offender. Um, by that, I mean, I tend to pick on my students a little bit. I don't mean it in a mean way. I just tend to, you know, tease people a bit. Uh, I do try to curb that habit a little, but it happens. If I happen to say something that really does offend you, let me know after class. So I can make a point of never doing that again. It's happened before. And I've never repeated that mistake since. So. We're all human. We all make mistakes. It is what it is. Wow. I guess I should have waited an extra five minutes. Five minutes is not fingers on the clock. For not that, not that many people. Um, actually, there's another class and everyone's lost. So, which is why I'm introducing myself at the beginning. They're just going to get to figure it out on their own. Okay. There is a recommended textbook. Uh, you guys are in computer programmer, correct? 
because I always have to double check because they don't tell me what program each given section is in because both computer engineering technology and computer programmer take this course. So I check for you guys, it's probably worth getting it. Uh, considering you can only get it online right now via the stupid Pearson, whatever the heck it is. Um, you've already paid for it and through your tuition, so might as well use it uh, because you'll need it for your level two database course. So is it a good book? It's okay. There are chapters I recommend you read. I tend to snip them so you have them in PDF format, but they're from the older edition. But honestly, the little bit that has changed is page numbers. I can't tell what the differences are between one edition to the next. Okay, so what can you expect this term? Lectures, obviously. Uh, labs, now you guys don't have me for labs. Two sections of the lab have uh, LM, two sections have Doug King. Uh, they're both pretty decent, they know the material, at least from what I've been able to ascertain from my perspective. Uh, so they will tell you their expectations in lab, when you go to class, their attendance policy, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if you have any questions about lab, reach out to them. There's two open ones there. And uh, there's one there, one there, one there. Take your pick. We're running out of chairs. Um, there's your inexperience, two assignments, one before the break, one at the end of the term. Um, again, your lab instructors are gonna be in charge of the assignments. I will hand them out in class, but they'll be the ones helping you out with it and grading them. Uh, however, you will have um, two tests or exams, I guess we should say. Um, you have a midterm exam and a final exam at the end. That's me. They will be the midterm test will be done in this room. The final exam will be somewhere else. Um, as I said earlier, our lectures are free form. I don't use lecture notes, uh, so don't even bother asking for lecture notes. I don't have them, uh, but you do have access to all the slide decks, and they're all uploaded. Um, the PowerPoints are there, so I remember what I'm supposed to talk about, as I mentioned before, the big gaggle of people walked in. Um, labs do gradually increase in difficulty. So the first lab is literally hold you by the hand, click here, click here, click here. Lab four and five will make you think. After the break, we literally start a whole new topic. So the course is designed so that basically one side of the database world is covered before the break and then the other half the other side's covered after the break so it's like a clean break in the middle and again the labs will start out pretty simple and they'll do that and lab nine is bad then lab 10 is easy because it's the last one it's a gimme um it's no point panicking now for you know 12 weeks from now um just warning you now the labs do this but that's to be expected um, assignments are going to be submitted by Brightspace. There, you'll always have two weeks minimum to do them. Realistically, I think it's usually a little more. I try to give it out a little early so you have more time to get your stuff sorted out. Uh, the midterm, I mean, the assignments are not particularly brutal. They are time consuming, yes. That's why they're called assignments and not home. But they're not uh, absurd. Um, the midterm test will be done in class because, well, you know, that's where it's going to be. And if it's like last term, it's going to be on paper using Scantron. If you've never experienced Scantron, good luck. Just saying. All right, so the course has three major objectives, uh, design and modeling and SQL. So design and modeling is what we're doing in the first half of the term, SQL and similar related topics will be in the second half. So the first half is very theory heavy. The second half is very practical based. So if you're good with theoretical concepts, the first half will be good for you. If you're good with hands-on stuff, the second half will be good for you. And if you're just middling and everything, then it's all gonna be good or bad, depending on you know how it goes for you. So you're gonna learn about basic database design, 
in actual fact, I keep forgetting to update this slide because we dropped a couple of these topics. Um, but you're going to learn about basic database design. You're going to learn about SQL. You're going to learn about uh, views. We are not going to be doing triggers and store procedures. They've pushed that off to next term. So that's the good news. That's one whole really complicated topic that's been dropped. I just forgot to update my slide deck. And uh, I have something called other stuff. Um, other stuff falls under transactions, um, normalization, that kind of stuff. Um, they're just topics that get thrown in here and there. Uh, there'll be some other things like life lessons from Dan. Like don't do what Dan did. I've been doing this long enough that I've made many, many mistakes. And I will give you guys anecdotes based on, you know, when Dan screwed up on production systems. So the course breakdown is as follows. 25% uh, of your grade comes from your labs. So not one single lab is worth, each lab is worth 2.5% of your grade. There's 10 labs, 2.5%. 10% is hybrids. Hybrids is something you probably, most of you have never experienced before unless you've been here at the college at Algonquin before. Hybrids is basically homework. We give you guys some work to do on your own, and then we will release some quizzes and you get to try the quizzes. There's four of them at, for 10% of your grade. So, you know, two and a half percent each. Uh, there'll be two assignments. They're combined, they're worth 30% of your final grade. The midterms were 50% of your grade and your final exam is 30. Now, Please note that dates are tentative. You know, things happen. Last term we had, you know, I had to skip a lecture because I got sick. You know, I'm not gonna come here and make everybody sick. Um, most of the labs except for lab one and uh, the assignments require, uh, do not require in-person submission, but Depends on what your lab monitor profs are going to say. So, but they are submitted on Brightspace. Um, the, all the due dates should already be showing up on Brightspace for you guys in the course shell. I've set all the dates for everything already. So, in theory, you should know when everything is due for this course, except for the the, for the assignments because I haven't published those yet. Um, so, as far as I know, exams are going to be in person, in person and on paper, midterm and final exam. But, you know, things have changed in the last couple of years and we have to be fluid with how we do things. Um, as we proceed through the term, things will adjust. Okay, Cal students. So you might not know what, for those of you that go through Cal, please make sure I get my your letter of accommodations earlier than later. It helps me set times for stuff. Now, if some of your accommodations involve getting extra time, and this is specifically for the midterm and the final exam, make sure you book your assessments with Cal. They will give you your extra time. I can't give you extra time in class because I have to leave because I got a class right after this one. So, at the midterm, if you have, you know, 50% more time, 100% more time, or whatever your accommodation may be, book with Cal. Cal is your friend. Any accommodations you can, this is where I'm going to plug Cal for all it's worth. My daughter is actually going through a co-op now, but she was here at the college. And um, the amount of stuff that they were able to do for her was spectacular right down to providing uh, noise canceling headphones while she writes her tests so she doesn't get distracted. Uh, which also happened to stream music for her, So, but it was an approved playlist. Extra time on her tests. Uh, they provided note-taking tools, et cetera, et cetera. So take advantage of Cal. A lot of you coming in right now may not, may not be aware that this is a resource you have, but it's really surprising what it is if you have any kind of learning disability you've got really bad ADD, or even if you take medication that makes you a little loopy, it might be worthwhile talking to them because they can give you temporary accommodations too. Um, definitely reach out to them. All right, uh, this is known as a 323 course. 
there's three hours of theory. In other words, two hours in class with me, one hour online, technically a week for hybrid, but realistically, we don't give you that much hybrid. So really it's two hours in class and then an hour here and there. Uh, two hours of lab every week. And technically you should be allocating up to three hours of study time for this course a week. Are you gonna need that much? Maybe, maybe not. It just depends on how well the material gets into your head. All right, Dan's rules for success in 82.15. Come to the lecture. However, I don't take attendance. And some people say, well, why don't you take attendance? Um, even before the big C hit, I told people that were sick to stay home. I used to get sick really, really easily. And I did not need people sneezing and spreading you know, disease throughout the room. As some of you have noticed, I've got a little camera going here, right there. I got a microphone on. I'll give you three guesses what that means. I'm recording my lectures. And it's not even because somebody has a special accommodation. I've been doing this for 10 years. I record my lectures. I post them on YouTube. Because what they used to have here was terrible for where we could host our media. So I... Yes, I put them on YouTube. They'll usually, if you're lucky, they go up the same day. If not, it'll be within a day or two. So if you are sick, don't come here and snot on your classmates, please. That's just gross. And the only thing you're going to really miss out on is the ability to ask questions live. I will, but however, you will also discover that I tend to respond to email pretty quick. So um, do your work, obviously. If you wanna, if you don't give us anything to grade, we can't give you grades. We don't grade when I intended to do that. That just, that's not how it works. We need tangible things in our quote unquote digital hands for us to be able to grade your stuff. Um, you need to hand your work in on time. Now, this I need to double check with my lab people, make sure that they're following the same policy as I usually do. What usually is, if it's a week late, it's 10% off the top. Two weeks late, it's an automatic zero. You don't submit it, you don't get it. I'm going to treat you guys like something that's going to be really shocking to some of you. I'm going to treat you like adults. For those of you coming right out of high school, that's going to be a really shocking experience. In other words, I'm not going to hunt you down. I'm not going to chase you for your work. I'm going to expect you to do it and hand it in. Because you know what? If you don't hand anything in, it's easy for us. We don't have to grade it. It's less work. It sounds harsh. But, you know, you're now in college. It's time to put on your big person pants and, you know, getting the job done. So if you don't hear me assign it in class, then it's not due. Again, I'm going to put the caveat of your lab instructors may, you know, have slightly different policies on this. so. They, they will go over what they expect from you in lab. Um, and number five, I just changed that. So the labs aren't due at the start of the next lecture. They're due the following Friday. So in other words, if lab one, for example, was released today, I think it was, or yesterday, it's due not this Friday. It's due the following Friday. So you literally have a week and a half to do the lab, like literally almost two full weeks to do the lab. Most of these labs do not take that long. So it's good. Okay, to official, the official to pass the course. So this is buried away in course outline. Then a big couple of big blocks of, you know, legalese jargon that, you know, the course outlines a contract between you and me. It says that this is what I'm gonna teach you. And this is how you're gonna be evaluated. These are the topics we will cover. But essentially it brings down to this point. You must write the final exam. And if you're coming into the final exam with a 90% and you decide not to write it, you fail the course. You can come in and just answer the first question. Technically, you wrote the exam. However, you must be present for the exam and you must at least try to answer it. You got to get 50% on tests and exams combined. So this is 50% on your tests and your hybrids, and then 50% on your uh, labs and assignments. So. 50% on the practical aspects, 50% on the theory aspects, plus you must at least try to write the exams. 
that's basically what you need to do to pass the course. <clears throat> okay, supported hardware and software. Windows laptops. Literally, I could end the slide here. Mac users. And I don't see a lot of Macs in here, but there are a few. Um, if you're running Mac OS, technically you can do this course on a Mac. It's going to be an experience for you, and I can't help you. Why? I've never touched a Mac in my life, except to look at someone and say, that's cute. I don't know what it's doing. I don't know why it's not working. Go reach out to the Discord. Maybe somebody in there can help you. I am not a Mac user. Just never had the time to learn and no interest in learning it. Uh, Linux users, congratulations. I can help you. Uh, I basically opt my, my workstation for my day job is Linux. I work on Linux all day. I use Windows at the school because Linux and the wireless network here are not friends. So it, it's just life. Um, however, if you are running Linux, it's totally doable. I can help you. Uh, I can set up a Linux workstation in about 17 minutes. So, yeah, not a problem. Like I said, I'm sorry, Mac people. Uh, now, if you've got one of the older Macs, you can install Bootcamp and install Windows on it, and then I can help you. Uh, if you got one of the new Macs, the M1, M2 Macs, uh, you're going to have a hard time in this program, period. Uh, why? Because later on, you must install Visual Studio for Windows. Guess what they don't make for Mac? And at level two, you, install, you need to install Microsoft SQL Server for Windows. Again, not on a Mac. So when you read the course requirements, they will be very big on the fact that you're supposed to be running a Windows computer. For this course, you can get away with a Mac. I just don't know how to help you if you, get, if you have problems with getting your software set up. Uh, there's one of the other profs that doesn't always way around it, and worst comes first, I can ask him for help. Uh, but he usually answers his emails like once a week. So, you know, you'll be waiting for help. All okay. right. Check your Algonquin Live email address. Why? I send out announcements. I like announcements. I use them. I don't send them out because I just feel like hearing myself talk. I usually send out announcements when I have something to, that's important that you guys should know about. Reply from your Algonquin Live email address. People say, well, why can't I just use my Gmail address? Two reasons. One, I don't want to know what your personal email address is. I can get it from Access, but I don't want it. Two, the Algonquin mail service, which runs through Office 365, has some really potent spam filters. If it decides it doesn't like your email address, I will not get your emails. If your email address has ever been flagged for questionable content, or your default code page on your whatever operating system is not, you know, standard English. It might get picked up, spam. Just saying. Uh, even though, it's, and just going to warn the students that are running Chinese on their laptops, that's usually the guilty party. Um, because even though it looks like an A, when it's coming through the Chinese uh, character set, it's not an A. Um, the spam filters have been known to block that. So use your Algonquin Live. It has an automatic pass through the filters. Just to make your life easier, make it easier to reach me. It, it says don't send email from Brightspace. It will not reach the instructor. Uh, I've seen it work sometimes, and I've seen it not work. Therefore, we just decide to say, no, it's not going to work. Because if it, if it sometimes works and sometimes does not, it might as well not work. It's like saying your car turns on sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. You can't say that your car works right. So don't do that. Um, always please include your name and your student number. Section number is not that important, at least if they're coming to me, because I've only got you guys in one section. Um, but it helps track down who it is we're talking to. There's three empty seats right there, guys. So when you email me, please include your name. Uh, also, make sure you make it to be the name that matches whatever you've got set in Brightspace. I will go look you up in Brightspace to see who you are. And if it doesn't match what's in Brightspace, because you know you can change your preferred name in Brightspace. If it doesn't match that, I'm not going to know who you are. 
which leads me to a, an aside for this. I apologize now. I will probably not remember any of your names. Doing this for 17 years at uh, this term, I've got almost 300 students between all my course sections. I am names in and out. I remember faces and voices, not names. Um, don't feel bad. It doesn't mean I don't care. It just means I can't remember names. Heck, sometimes I call my daughter by her cat's name. They're so much alike. It's like you. So, and it, I've been like that since I've been that tall. So it's something I've worked on for years and it's never gotten any better. Uh, even for my students from last term, I think I remember three names out of all my students from last term. It's just names and me, no. Okay, lecture recording. I already covered this, uh, but like I said, I try. It's a value added service. The college does not require it. I do it out of my own time. When I render the video and prep it and upload it, I don't do it. I do it because I don't want sick people in my class. And I also do it because I don't need to do reviews because I can say, did you watch the recording if you missed a topic? Um, I tend to upload it within one or two days. I do have a lab right after this class and I'll be hitting the render button. So it'll probably be up by the end of the day today. No guarantees, but it's potentially there. And I do have a channel. I've already had people subscribe. So I'm guessing some people already loaded up the uh, introduction slides and uh, noticed it and people have already subscribed. My channel is not monetized. You're not gonna make me any money. My view count is not that high anyways. Okay, so that is the introduction to the course. That actually took longer than I expected, but that's okay. Um, the good news is because your lecture is on Tuesday, you're not gonna miss any lectures because of holidays. Yesterday, all the classes are canceled. Family day, classes are obviously canceled. Really sucks if you got classes on Mondays. All right. So you'll notice that there's a different name on the bottom of the slide because these slides were created by a prof called Sandra. She's the course lead. Um, another thing you will notice as I go through this is I don't follow the slides exactly. I, like I said, I use them as a memory aid. Um, the slides are your basically a step guide. All right. So today, this slide deck's pretty short, it's 30 slides. Uh, usually I do 30 slides in under an hour, so you know. Um, basically, we're just gonna cover uh, what databases are, uh, the characteristics of them, a few definitions of some key terms, uh, defining some uh, components, define a couple of other terms, and we'll talk about the development process. All right, so most of you have experienced a database in some way, form, or other. You might not have actually thought of it, but pretty much any time you load up a web page, you access anything that has your information that's talking to a database somewhere, somehow. Um, those of you that have Android phones, congratulations, there's a database in your pocket. Android's got, a, basically it's running uh, SQLite for a lot of its internal functionality. Um, Access is running against a database. Brightspace, obviously, is running against a database. Your bank is running a database. Whether it's using an app, whether you're using a web page, whether you're using a client application, for those of us that are old enough to remember the actual installing applications to talk to the bank, some of us are past a certain vintage where you know going to access your bank functions was not opening up a web page; it was installing the RBC client, and then clicking a button it would dial up to the bank. It was kind of interesting back in the day, but even then it was talking to a database. So there will be there's you, your computer something, and then a database. This something could be a web server, could be an application server, could be any number of microservices that all do these little bits and pieces. But in the end, it all goes into a database. It all comes out of a database. The work is run on database. So a database is an organized collection of logically related data. Now, that means 
essentially the purpose of a database is to take information, organize it, and store it in such a way that it is consistent, accessible. And often a database is referred to as a self-describing collection of integrated tables. Now that's a lot of words, just to say that there's a bunch of things in a database that are related to each other. And all these things basically describe the database as a whole. It's, you can think of it such as um, your house or your apartment. You've got a you've got a, basically your your living area where you know your house or your apartment, and it's broken down into separate rooms that have different functions. The kitchen is where food gets made. The bedroom is where you should be sleeping. You know, the bathroom is where you're probably taking a shower. I hope you're taking a shower at least once a week. You know. It's, but it's self-describing, as in each table serves a purpose, the table describes itself, each of the tables put together will describe the entire database. Because it's called integrated because most tables have relations to each other. So an example of a relation right now would be the, the prof to the students, right? If I have many students, each of you have one database prof or lecture prof, I should say in this case. And that is a relationship. And in this case, we could think of two objects in here that are self-describing, students, instructor, and then relationship interconnects them. And the database itself is called self-describing because it actually stores a description of itself. It stores its structure inside itself. So, that one's really hard to expl to give a real world example, um, but essentially the database structure that you access, its definition is contained within that database. It's not something on the outside that says the database, this is what you are. The database itself is self-aware, not an intelligence kind of sense, but is self-aware of what things are and where they are. Nothing, it doesn't need anything outside of itself to be able to describe anything inside of it because it's all self-contained. It's as if the closest I can say is each of you can self-describe. You don't need an external party to describe you to yourself because you're self-contained. In this case, your DNA describes who you are. The database metadata is its DNA. It describes the structure of the database and how it contains stuff. And basically metadata is literally the information that describes the database is basically the data about the data. Or going back to the human example, it's basically the DNA of the database. The met metadata describes the physical structure of the database. Just like the DNA does a basic description of who you are. Not necessarily what you've done to yourself since you were born, but basically just decided this is who you are once you come out. <clears throat> I already covered the first point and the second point, so let's move on. Um, so databases are all around us. Uh, you'd be really surprised on just how much of your day is stored in a database. All right. Online video streaming. I don't like the phrase TV streaming, but online, that's straight from the textbook, by the way. You can tell how to touch the textbooks authors are. It's online video streaming. Whether it's Netflix or Amazon Prime or, you know, now that all the uh, TV, all the different TV studios are suddenly realizing that they are losing money by not having their own, you know, Disney Plus, Paramount, blah, blah, blah. They all have databases on the inside. What do these databases contain? Information about their users information about the videos they have, regional lockouts, where are the videos stored, uh, descriptions of the videos, that kind of stuff. A lot of this data gets stored in specialized database systems. So you guys are gonna be learning a general, a general database system in this term, which is MySQL. There are specialized services that do specific jobs. And database engines like Redis and Cassandra are designed for huge amounts of data to process for, which is how, you know, Netflix gives you suggestions or Amazon gives you suggestions when you go 
shopping in Amazon and you click on something and it goes, huh, look at that. You, you look at cat things, suddenly it starts offering you cat stuff nonstop for the next month. Amazon Prime Video, for some unknown reason, you've watched The Expanse. Now it's suggesting every SFI show in their catalog. That's what it does. That It's all in the database. Personal cloud storage. How many of you take advantage of Google, for example, if you've got an Android phone, you're using um, the Google services to, to back up your photos off your phone, right? I use uh, my Prime account. Prime gives you unlimited photo storage, just so you know. You install the app and it backs up your pictures to your Amazon cloud. And, uh, you know, that's another one. Or Apple to the Apple cloud or whatever. Uh, same other thing similar to that would be uh, Dropbox, one, I've, you know, insert preferred cloud service here. Um, for example, on my laptop, I don't keep anything outside of my OneDrive folder except for stuff I don't care to lose. Why? My laptop dies, I haven't lost anything. It's all backed up. And in this, these guys, this serv these services, what they do is they take your data, they store it on a disk, and then they store a pointer in a database. So when you're browsing the internet to look at your files, you're actually browsing your files. You're browsing a database that says these are your files. A little bit, there's a slight difference, right? Uh, sports. Um, I know there's people in here that care about sports. I'm not one of them. But for those of you that care about sports, especially sports that are statistics heavy, baseball, football, hockey, I'm assuming soccer is statistics heavy, but, you know, I never make it past the first 10 minutes of falling asleep, so I wouldn't know. But baseball and hockey, football, that kind of stuff, they're very heavy in the statistics. You know, how many times, how many goals do they have on average, blah, blah, blah. And all that is stored in databases. People keep betting pools. You know, you've got the office pools. You've got, uh, what the heck is it uh, that the old G runs? Um, sports. Uh, Proline. There we go. Thanks. That's good. But at least somebody came up with it because you know what? I couldn't be. I was drawing a blank. Proline is another example. It's all running in a database. It runs stats against games. You bet on games. Um, finances. I mean, come on. If you think a bank runs without a database, you're fooling yourself. Stock market. Everything that has to do with money is in a database. They're the originators of the electronic database. They were the pioneers. They were the first ones to have it, quickly followed by pretty much every government that spies on you. That's pretty much the follow-up to who had the databases first. It's banks, government, and porn. I'm just gonna call it the way it is. Those were the top three that pushed the industry. Right, you got the banks who are trying to make some more secure. You got the governments who are collecting information about you. Well, the last one, I guess you know why. But they all push the industry in different ways. But they all push, you know. It is what it is. But honestly, that's that's what it is. All three of those examples are high volume transaction environments. Banks have a lot of transactions every day, and I've noticed this in the last. Five years, and I look at my bank statements online because I don't get them on paper anymore. It used to be, you know, in a given month, I might have like 20, 25 transactions. I think one month I had over 300, like hundred, $1.50 here, $2 there because I tapped on the way by to get a coffee, you know, got some gas, tapped my phone, tap, 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 buck 50 here, buck 50 there. Oh, geez, I'm out of something. Amazon, click. You know, it's a high volume. The banking industry has gotten really crazy just how much volume goes through systems now compared to even 10 years ago. Almost nobody carries cash in their pockets anymore. Well, government organizations. All right. Okay. In Canada, we got the CRA, Canada Revenue Agency. They know everything about you. How do they know everything about you? They get everything about your money, right? The revenue agency. There is 
all the various programs that you can sign up for, OSAP. Those of you in here with OSAP, whether it's loan, a grant, or whatever, even applied to client, all that went into a database. It is um, surprisingly in depth. The Canadian government's actually pretty good at not overanalyzing our citizens' information, uh, unlike some other countries that really love analyzing their citizens' information. The Americans are really good at it. Um, it's surprising that they do, but it you know it could be used for legislation. They do research. You know they're saying, oh, and we noticed in the last five years that people are having same everything costs more. Well, we're not going to do anything, but you know it's good to know that we know that they're going to get mad eventually. That's the government. Social media, Facebook, the cancer that it is, Twitter, which is dying very quickly. Thanks, Elon. That's the one good thing he's done for the world. Uh, TikTok, which is now pretty much banned in the U.S. You know, take your pick. All these social media services, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. They have an insane amount of data on their users. It all goes into databases. Um, Facebook uses MySQL, kind of. Their version of MySQL is not the version of MySQL you're running. Theirs is heavily modified. And very little of it's actually really MySQL. It just uses MySQL as a in-between layer to other things. E-commerce. How many people in here have bought something online in the last three months? Don't lie. What? Every day, that's what I'm saying. I look at mine, it's like, woo, look at that. But e-commerce, whether you buy something from Amazon or you're buying it from some little Etsy shop or you're, you know, you go online against a database. Healthcare. Hospitals contain an awful lot of data about you. They know things about you that nobody else knows, not even yourself. It's kind of cool. Um, thankfully, they are starting to get better and better at integrating this into the back end systems. Uh, I have to say that hospitals are actually behind the times for a lot of their records management. And they use very secure systems, uh, usually. And the stuff is pretty complex, but they have, you know, some pretty solid back ends. Uh, that could also go through your health insurance companies. Uh, most of you get health insurance through school. I think it was through Sun Life, if I remember right. Or you get benefits if you have a job, whatever. You know, that, that those healthcare benefits are all stored in a database somewhere too. Database is everywhere. Weather. You know what I did before I left my house today? I checked the weather. I wanted to know how cold I was be, going to be when I walked back home tonight. I live a 20-minute walk from the school, so and I was trying to decide how miserable I was going to be. Or whether or not I was going to drive. <laughs> so weather data is actually really cool because it's really complex, constantly changing, constantly changing data. Um, you, and you, all kinds of data backends are used for this, whether it's MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Cassandra. There's a bunch of different database servers that do this. Okay, so now we've discussed how you know basically your entire life is just embedded in a database somewhere or multiple databases. And if you were paranoid before, you probably are now. Now we're going to talk about the characteristics of relational databases, uh, because there are two kinds of databases, relational and non-relational. Um, and essentially, whenever you hear you know the buzz term big data, it just means that it's somebody has a lot of data. That's literally all that means. It's, this company is a huge database. It's big data. That's all it is. Uh, don't let the the big the buzzwords fool you. It's just saying you know there's a difference between the guy who's running a little website that has recipes on it and Amazon. It's just a difference of scale. At one point, it stops being normal data and it becomes big data. That's literally all it is. Um, so, in a database, data is stored in something called tables. And tables have rows and columns. Now, how many of you have used a spreadsheet? 
whether it's Excel or, you know, something else. Okay, good. At least some of you have used spreadsheets. Okay. So for those of you that have used spreadsheets, the concepts of rows and columns is not going to come as a shock. The way I like to visualize this for people is picture a filing cabinet. Okay, how many of you here have worked with an account or are an account or has dealt in an accounting department before I continue with this? Yeah, every year the group gets smaller. It's actually dealt with an account. Okay, I'm going to keep going with it anyways. So you got a filing cabinet. You guys know what a filing cabinet is, right? Okay. Hey, you know, I got to ask nowadays. You got a filing cabinet. Inside the filing cabinet, you got folders, right? And for those of you that are actually organized, each folder holds a different kind of information, but each folder will always contain the same kind of information. So you can think of the filing cabinet as the database, each of those folders as a different table, and each of those pieces of paper in that folder as a different record. That's the closest to a real world physical, I can touch it example of what a database is. So, on this piece of paper, which is a record, it has columns, in other words, fields. If you were looking at a your credit card statement, what would be on these fields? It'd be maybe your name, your address, a date, your outstanding balance, your credit level, maybe, and then a bunch of, you know, how much money you spent that month. And that's, you know, one thing that goes into that folder. So a database can have multiple tables. Usually they do. Rarely will a database only ever have one table. Uh, at that point, there's almost no point of having a database that's only one table. Each table stores data about different things. Again, to my filing cabinet example, thinking of mine at home, I open it up, you'll have, you know, credit card statements, car insurance, you know, cell phone bill, you know, that kind of stuff. Various topics, you know, tax papers, you know, for 2022, blah, 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 find out how much you owe to the government, etc. Each folder has different kind of information in it. Usually it's all related and all similar data. Each row in a table stores data about an occurrence or an instance of the thing of interest. For example, my folder that has my all my paperwork for my car will have all the invoices from the car dealership for all the oil changes, for example, they're all in there. The brake job, blah, blah, blah. There's multiple instances of each visit I took to go to the car dealership to get my car fixed or maintained. And I keep a copy of each one of those in the same folder. So each of those is a record of a given visit and what was done. So those are instances of data. And it stores data and relationships. Uh, another example in here, and I bet you I'm going to, there's going to be a slide about this in a minute, but I usually, at this point, so when I remember to do this example. In this room, we have two kinds of data. Well, way more than two, but I'm super simplifying. We have students, we have profs, right? Each one of you is an instance of a student. You're each a unique collection of data, but you are a student. Your data is different than his data, different from her data, different from his data, but we collect all the same information about each and every one of you. We have your name, we have your date of birth, we have a student number, you got a unique identifier, you know, of some sort, which is, could be your SIN number, your passport number, your student visa number, your study permit number, you know, insert what number it is that allows you to uniquely identify you outside of the student number, that is in there. We'll have your email addresses, your phone numbers, that kind of stuff. That is a record that identifies a student. We can genericize and say students all have these characteristics, but each instance of you has unique sets of that correct characteristics. So each of you is a record in a database. You're all individually unique unto yourselves, but you're all the same. There's an existential crisis. All right, so this is where um, people that teach database start arguing about, did you have a question? I just saw a hand. 
I know, no worries. It's just because I saw movement out of the corner of my eye and I saw your hand moving a little bit. I'm like, is that a question? No, okay. So at this point in time, this is where um, database people start arguing over terminology. Uh, depending on what book they used when you learned, these two terms are used in opposites, information and data. So when I went through school, the textbook that we use, the profs that I had said that Data is derived from information. This textbook says information is derived from data. Yay. So data is stuff that is recorded. When we talk about the weather, we might be talking about the um, atmospheric pressure, the wind direction, the speed of the wind, what is the current temperature, the humidity, uh, uh, precipitation for any given moment in time. Those are pieces of data. You take all that data, shove it in a database, run some reports, run some analytics, and then you can turn that into, at least as far as they're concerned, information. Information is knowledge that is derived based on the data. For example, we can run some steps based on the database here we have for all the students of how many students do we have coming from any given country? How many languages are spoken? It's always interesting seeing those stats. Uh, how many students are, are uh, international students versus domestic students? You know, that's all information we can derive from our student database. And these numbers change year to year. Um, some years we have a lot more international students. Some years we have less. I've noticed we tend to have more international students in the winter term and the summer term than we do in the fall term. Why? I don't know. But apparently, you know, that's when people decide to come here. It's cool. It's just, you know, an interesting fact that we can derive from our enrollments. Um, Information is data is presented in meaningful context. In other words, if I just say 65, everybody here is going to go, what's 65 about? Because I'm not giving you context. However, if I go, I have uh, 65 students that are going to do really well this term. I'm putting context on it. I don't know if it's going to be 65. I'm just picking 65. But that is data that's presented in it with context. So it's meaningful based on the data that's been collected. We can summarize, order, and average, and compute data. Um, for example, Amazon loves data. They love lots and lots of data, data goblins. They run stats on how much, on average, does the average person in Canada spend on Amazon? And then they break it down by segments of uh, gender, age, region. There's no people in Ottawa spend more on Amazon on average than people in Toronto. And can you, can you prove that I'm telling the truth? No, but it's the truth. How do I know? Actually, one of my friends works for Amazon. He runs in there at data analytics department and he was curious on just what the averages were. So, you know, he asked permission and he ran some reports. And on average, people in Ottawa spend 10% more than people in Toronto on Amazon. Cool. Apparently, we have more disposable income, or we just like more crap. I don't know. But that's data that's been processed by summarizing and ordering and finding averages and that kind of stuff. And there it's based on data that's accumulated and it's become information. Databases record the data, so they'll take disparate pieces of information, shove them into a structure that can be worked with. So data for students, classes, and grades could, in the end, can be calculated out to a GPA, right? So you took X number of classes, your grades were Y, you know, X and Y put together will give you your GPA, which hopefully is not an F, also known as a one. And we can produce that by the data that's in Access. It's kind of cool. All right, so database systems consist of four components.
The first one is the users. That's the person that interacts with some piece of software, whether it's a web page, an application, an app on their phone. The teller at the bank, the person at the registrar's office. It's a person that's interacting with the database. The database application itself. So the database application in this context is, for example, back to Amazon. The database application is their shopping site. You add things to your shopping cart, you check out, you are a user interacting with their application. There is a database management system. So that is the software that runs on the server out there somewhere that allows the application to store stuff in the database. It does a translation from whatever the application says to whatever the backend expects. Database management systems include things such as MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, uh, Postgres. You know, those are the database management systems. And then you have the database itself. The database itself is the structure and the data. The database management system determines how that structure is contained, how the data gets written to the disk, you know, how, who's allowed to talk to it, blah, blah, blah. The database itself in the end is just a chunk of information sitting on the disk somewhere. It will be physically different depending on what database management system uses it, but the internal structure may be the same, if that makes the sense, sense to you. For example, you've got, you've got a Ford car and you've got a Mazda. You get inside, they have seats, they have a steering wheel, they got, you know, potentially a, a gear shift of some sort. They got a way to turn it on. Great, that's the structure of a car. It's got wheels. There's something that makes it go down the road. However, what happens on the inside and how it behaves is determined by the management system, which would be, you know, however they decided to put the car together. So the, the car is the data. The data management system is actually what makes the car happen. So when we talk about uh, the components of a database system, we're going to start, the first one is SQL. And you'll notice I said SQL and not SQL. You'll hear people, oh, I use SQL. No, you don't use SQL. Um, as you can tell, that's a pet peeve of mine. And you'll actually have profs that'll use the word SQL all the time and it's wrong. I'm just going to put that out there. It's incorrect, uh, completely incorrect. It's like saying IBM is IBM. Uh, it's an initialism, not an acronym. Just saying. An acronym you pronounce, an initialism you say the letters. Considering IBM created SQL, but the stupid thing is it comes from way back in the day that originally SQL was supposed to be called SQL, S-E-Q-U-E-L, except IBM got sued by a company in England over the copyright of it. So IBM goes, we haven't even launched this. Good enough. We quit. It's called SQL instead. But some unknown reason people insist on calling it SQL, even though it was never actually its name. Whatever. Um, my daughter actually goes by my room. She'll just go SQL. Because I work from home. So she before, and I'm so glad she's doing her co-op. I don't have to put up with that. But she'd walk by, go into the bathroom. She'd go, SQL. Because she knows it pisses me off. Oh, that don't even get me started. So that's the language. We're going to be learning SQL in the second half of the term. So SQL is a, it's, it's a programming language. It's a language, but it's not a programming language. It's a querying language. Talk to the database. Uh, you got database management system. I already described that ad nauseum. Basically, it's a software that lets you talk to the database in the back end. Uh, the database application is something that sits in front of it. We already discussed that too. So if you want to have a picture, that's how it works. We got the users, they talk to the application, the application talks to the database, the database, sorry, the database management system, it talks to the database, it gets data out of it, it returns it to the database management system, it returns it to the application, the application gives it to the user. So every time you talk to a database, there's multiple layers between you and it. The only thing is this term, uh, you guys are going to be skipping the database application side of the deal. 
you're going to be talking to the database management system directly. You're not going to be using an application. You're going to be using an application, yes, but the application is the interface for the management system. And an application that uses SQL basically interjects an extra little piece right in the middle right here of SQL. So why do we keep repeating this? There we go. I didn't create these slides, right? So every time I, I review them for the start class and I'm like, oh, I forget. All right, so multi-user database applications include some examples, a customer relation management system. For those of you that don't know what that is, that is when you call any given place and they ask you for your information and they look you up. For example, most of you here, when you are putting out your applications, but you haven't accepted your um, your offer, you're in a system here at the school in a CRM system at the school called Salesforce. Some of you may have heard of Salesforce. Um, Salesforce is the IBM of the customer relation management world. They are basically the biggest provider of customer relation management systems. It's a cloud-based system. Is it good? I, I've used it. I didn't think it was great, but you know, it's there. Um, enterprise resource planning, ERP systems. Some people don't know what that is. It's basically an accounting system on steroids. So if you work for a small company, you know, some bakery down the street, they might be using QuickBooks. So they're using an accounting system called QuickBooks. On the other hand, a company like, um, oh, I'm trying to think of a company, a really good example of that would have a good ERP system, uh, TP-Link. Some of you may not know what TP-Link is and some of you will. TP-Link makes networking equipment and smart home things and all kinds of other stuff. They use an enterprise resource planning system so they can do everything from how much they sold to tracking where all the parts are for all their gadgets to when they need to reorder chips to when they need to reorder plastic to when they need to reorder stuff. They have assemblies of the products. The entire They know that if I get a one of their Casa Home smart switches for my thing, it, no, they know that it has chips X, Y, Z. It has so many ounces of copper in it. It has this much plastic. The resource planning system will do that. That's an example of a multi-user, a big multi-user database. Um, another good one that's not in here would be LMS systems. And if you don't know what that is, Brightspace, Blackboard, Canvas. They're big. They got a lot of data. They know a lot about you. More about you than you think they know. Because they know how you're doing in school. Even before you do. I'm just saying, data is data is really cool. Uh, as a person who does this for a living, I find it entertaining when I open the eyes of people of just how much data we collect on that get collected about you. Uh, E-commerce. Obviously, we track they track purchases, they track web activity. Um, what you might not realize is your path through a website is tracked into a database so they can optimize how fast from the front page when you check out is. If they realize that there's one extra page in the middle that's pointless, they'll find a way of taking it out to get you to go from I landed on the page to I'm paying giving you money faster. That's marketing. <laughs> Their job is to make you spend money faster and more of it. Reporting and data mining, those are other uh, common applications. And you actually have an elective, I think, in your last term, for level three or level four for uh, business intelligence. Uh, basically business intelligence is what this is. It doesn't generate new data. It generates new information based on the data. Uh, it's basically, you've got data that comes in, you run reports, you learn. And based on the historical trends, you can predict the future or at least you hope you can. And um, I'm not even gonna go through this slide very much. It's in the deck for you guys to look at if you feel like it. Um, and it just shows examples of volumes of data, 
Uh, a CRM system could have 10 million rows of data. An ERP system will easily have over 10 million rows of data. Um, an e-commerce site will have billions of rows of data. And if you're talking about Amazon, we're talking more about uh, trillions of rows of data. Uh, would you believe that not even Amazon knows just how much data they have? Because different divisions of Amazon track their data in different places. So Amazon it's, does not know how much data they have. And just think about that for a second. Their job is knowing how much to, to know as much about you as possible, but they don't know how much about you they know. It's kind of cool, but you know, it is what it is. Um, you know, you've got data mining, which have 100 millions of rows of data. You could have, you know, a doctor's office, which might have 10 to 50 users with a couple hundred thousand rows of data. And if my doctor's office is any example to go by, they probably have way more data than that because everything they do is 100% electronic. There is no paper in that office at all. Like when you get a prescription, they don't write it out by hand. They should literally, she goes click, 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 and a piece of paper comes out and she gives it to you. Thanks, doctor. Uh, so, yeah. So, basic functions of application programs. So, those would be creating and processing forms. So, for example, when you go, you hit Brightspace, you're, pro you're provided a login page. That's a form. You punch in your user data. It takes that information, prepares it, and sends it off to the database for authentication. It's processing your queries. I get reports. I can pull up the gradebook, and it shows me everybody's grades and how they're doing. It executes application logic, as in um, Brightspace is another good example. I can set alerts saying, hey, a student has not submitted work from you know three labs in a row. Let me know when people hit that, that level so I can promptly ignore it. Like I said, I don't chase you guys down, so I don't use those features. But some people do use those, use those features and they will hunt you down. It can control the application itself. So the application controls itself, obviously. Uh, so when we talk about database servers and just these numbers are not realistic, uh, but they are, at the same time. So Microsoft SQL Server shows that 60 to 90% of companies use it. Why is it such a wide number? Like some people go, well, how can you not know if it's 60 or 90? That's like 30%, it's a third. How can you not know? That's because there are multiple versions of MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. And if you have the embedded version, they may not even know they're running it. So back in the day, there was a product called ACPAC. It was an accounting package. ACPAC, when you installed it, it installed with an embedded version of SQL Server. There was no management tools, none of that. It was just sitting there happily running in the background. So that eats up the percentage. It's just hard to say exactly what percentage. Oracle, 40 to 80%. Yes, 40 to 80% of people use it. Uh, the funny thing about Oracle is that number is not getting any bigger. Oracle's sales have been flat for 15 years. There are people have paid into Oracle and they're stuck with Oracle. Oracle makes its money off returning customers. Very rarely does anybody start new. Like when somebody buys another Oracle license, odds are they're already an Oracle customer. They don't get new customers. They just have existing customers that keep giving them money. Is it a bad product? No. Is it an expensive product? Yes, very, very, very expensive. Like, you know, multiple kidneys expensive. Uh, MySQL, 80%. And this is the one that irritates me, that stat on all of this is when they put it MySQL at 80%. Um, because MySQL is installed by default on anything that is a web server. Last time I checked, it was something like 40% of the internet, internet is running on WordPress. Guess what WordPress uses? MySQL. So automatically, if your company is running anything on WordPress, it's using MySQL by default. It's good to learn learn it because, like I said, it's everywhere. It's like a foot fungus that just won't go away. 
because you install a Linux server, the second you install what they call a LAMP stack, it's going to have MySQL, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP or Python, right? That's the last, the, the P. The M is pretty much always there. By default, that's where people learn how to do web development is with MySQL. IBM DB2, 15 to 30% of businesses use it. So, again, that one is a strange one. Specifically because a lot of companies don't use IBM DB2, but the companies that do use it are massive. BMO runs on DB2. So the Bank of Montreal, a big segment of their backend databases that's not living in the world of COBOL is running on IBM DB2. IBM DB2 is used by governments. It's used by large corporations like Ford and Dodge and you know other manufacturers. Why? Because IBM DB2 runs on mainframes. Yes, you can install it on your PC and they make a version for your PC. They even make a version for the Macs. Congratulations, Mac users. They also make one that runs on a freaking Android phone. It runs from everything from an Android phone to a computer that's the size of this room. That's why the numbers are small, but the segment that is using them are massive. Uh, Postgres. This is the black sheep of the list. Uh, Postgres is slowly picking up speed. Uh, it is replacing Oracle. It is 90% compatible with Oracle. It gives a bunch of things that Oracle makes you pay for for free. Um, in the U.S., the the uh, large segments of the U.S. government have switched over to Postgres as their open source database of choice, including the, the DOD, Department of Defense, and Canadian Armed Forces are also using Postgres, so you know. Uh, you know, on the third floor, you may not have seen it yet, but there's a couple of rooms that have, you know, a lot of military-type stuff in it. That's the uh, GIS program, the Graphical Information System. They use Postgres in that program. Why? Because you can include the GIS stuff for free. You know, and it's actually really good. Uh, how many of you have a PlayStation? How many of you log into your PlayStation? Can't use it otherwise. Uh, when you log in, it actually authenticates against the Postgres database in the back end. It has nothing to do with the security issues that Sony has had. Because their server admin suck doesn't mean the software sucks. Uh, but Postgres is slowly picking up momentum. Uh, several departments of the Kenyan government are now switching over to it as they decide to modernize some of their infrastructure. Instead of buying another newer Oracle license, they're looking at how hard is it to move from Oracle to Postgres. There's even an extension for Postgres to make it more Oracle-like. So you can literally take the database from one and shove it in the other, and then you just minor tweaking, and it works. It's kind of cool. Uh, then the ones on the other side, which are the non-relational, uh, MongoDB, Hadoop, uh, Ryak, and Couchbase, those are non-relational. They are tend to use in data warehouse centers. I can't really tell you much about that because I don't deal with the non-relational side of the world very much. I know more of the other side. All right, so that's an example of an application form. Congratulations, there's spots type stuff in it. It looks, shows you data. Um, so this first bit up here is what SQL looks like, which we'll be learning after the break. Um, it's fairly English. It's pretty readable. Uh, compared to Java, it's a breeze to read. Uh, you guys have no idea. Just, <laughs> it's easy to read. So you could run a report. It'll give you results. It's cool. And you can take an SQL statement like that and you could turn it into a report that looks like this. That's just output from a database. Um, so the database application itself controls what's happening. Uh, it makes sure only things that are allowed to happen, happen. Uh, it, it avoids people having to type stuff into the database directly. That'd be really bad. For those of you that have incompetent managers at some point in your life, we've all had them. Can you imagine that person actually interacting with the database directly and inserting data, like insert into the whatever? Just picture that. No, this the application takes care of that for them. 
All right, so the database management system, so which is the next layer down. So you got the users, you got the applications, and you got the management system. Its purpose in life is to actually create the database. It creates the tables. It does all the supporting structures to make it work right, such as indexes and relationships and whatever. It allows you to modify the data, insert, update, delete of the database data itself. Uh, it allows you to read the data out of the database. What's the point if you can put it in, but you can never see it? So it allows you to read it. Uh, it does maintenance. So the server will make, will identify when the database is running a little slow and it'll optimize the tables, clean up the indexes, it does some housekeeping, um, runs backups, that kind of stuff. Enforces rules um, later in the, not in this term, but in later courses, you'll learn about how that enforces rules. Uh, controls concurrency. Concurrency is interesting. We'll talk about that right at the end of the term. But picture, how many of you have had this experience? You go to open the door and there's somebody standing there and you're both trying to go through the door at the same time. And you both stand there going, you go, no, you go. No, you go. Okay, that's called concurrency, as in you're just trying to decide which one gets to go first. Right, so the database server management system arbitrates who gets to go through the door first. That's its per That's one of its big jobs. Think about it this way, where imagine if every time you did a transaction at the bank, you only your transaction was allowed to happen at any given point in time with the millions of transactions every day. Imagine how long it would take to get anything done. So going, hey, we got three people trying to do some things. Two people are going out through two different doors. That's cool. Third person's going to wait their turn because they're trying to use the same door as the other guy. So that means two get to go through. One has to wait a you know, tenth of a second for the person to walk through the door. So that's the concurrency. And it does backups and recovery. Well, you know, always back up your data. If you haven't learned that yet, you will learn it. All right. So some more examples. Microsoft Access. Um, Microsoft Access, Access is a personal database system. Basically, it's meant to run on a one computer with one person using it. It's a low-end product in the sense that it has very low system requirements. It also really is not meant for multi-user. So, you know, for those of us of a certain age may remember a product called DBase way back in the day. Or Fox Pro. Those were the big ones back then. And they they brought along Access and it's around. Not used that much, but it has its purpose, but, you know, rarely, you know what it is. Its purpose is it tries to hide as much of what happens behind the scenes with a pretty face. Um, it's a good place to start if you're an absolute beginner, but not for database professionals. It's, you know, like trying to paint a car with like a, like a little paintbrush. You can do a nice job, but it's really not what it's for. Um, we're just skipping that step completely. You guys actually get to play with Access next term. Congratulations. Um, so with Access, it has data entry forms, reports, queries that happen right in front of the user. And then the, the application itself takes care of processing the form and it talks to the database and it does stuff in the back. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have an enterprise class database system, so these are Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres. I'll throw MySQL in there just for argument's sake. Um, is it enterprise grade? I don't think so. But so many enterprises use it that it's kind of hard to say that it's not. Um, so what happens is instead of like access where the person interacts with the forms directly and then the application is running right there at the same time, there are different systems that all talk to the same database. You could have an application. So um, a good example for you guys from my workplace we have a database in the back end that keeps track of everything we sold to a customer. The database actually controls what the customer has in their software. Our software is sold modular. In other words, uh, you can buy, you know, SignLab vinyl versus SignLab print and cut. It's the same software, but depending on what is defined in the database, the software will do different things. We will sell that software to 3M or to Eastman or to another company. 
and we rebrand it, but the database determines what the software is allowed to do. Because that customer says, well, our customers are not allowed to save files locally. Guess what? The database says, no, you're not allowed to save the file locally, and it gets embedded in the encrypted license files. Really nifty. So this database has an e-commerce site in front of it. It has an application where the programmers can go in and define new products. Um, there's a portal where people can run reports to find out what has been sold and what how things are configured. Um, Expo web services we don't have, but that's you know basically a, a layer for letting one business talk to another business. And mobile apps, we don't have a mobile app, but a good example of a mobile app that you guys might experience is um, your banking apps, right? You got an app on your phone, Bank of Montreal, RBC, whatever. You've got a bank app on your phone. You can go to the website, which is might as well be an e-commerce portal. You go to the bank. The tellers are using, you know, their version of it. And it's, what they're using is not what you see on the internet. It's an enterprise application instead. But they're all talking to the same thing in the end. So this database sits in the back. It's managed by the database manager system. There's probably some SQL happening between point A and point B. And each of these applications are going through these layers to talk to it. So what's cool is the bank teller could update your bank balance, transfer some money, and then the database shows it, and then you look look at it in your mobile app, and the data's there because they're all talking to the same data store in the end. They're just going a different way to get at it. All right. So in MySQL, when you start using MySQL, uh, it's going to look a little bit like this. Down the left, for those of you over there, down the left, you've got the list of database, the database structure, which includes the schemas, also known as databases, the tables and their columns. You can type in queries here, and the output happens here. This is what you're going to need to look at in the second half of the term. You don't need to know this now. This is for after uh, last week of February 1st of March. That's when we're going to be doing this. But that's what MySQL, the administration tool, looks like. OK, how, much, how many slides do I have left? Oops, moving back. All right, we're still got lots of time. Um, so there's three types of database design. So the first one is from existing data. So this isn't as common anymore as it used to be. Uh, why? Because rarely are things being changed from one application to another. So back in the day, you had a lot of paperwork. And would you'd analyze the paperwork and you'd design the database based on the existing data. So we'd collect invoices and collect sales orders, HR records, that kind of stuff. We'd extract that information. We'd get maybe there's some databases that are being used, we'd extract some of the structure from that, and we'd design using normalization principles and create a new database. So that's from an existing data source. You've got new system development which is much more common nowadays, uh, much more interesting, I will say. Um, so this, you're starting from scratch. There is nothing, There might be something similar out there, but not exactly what you want. So then you sit down, you all get together, you create a data model from the application requirements, you collect information from the users, collect you know all the stakeholders, as they call it. You collect their system requirements, you take that information, you transform it into a database design. So essentially, there's a vision quest, then you collect information about the vision quest, then you turn the vision quest into a design. And then the third one is database redesign, which happens uh, not that often. This is usually when a major upgrade is happening. So for example, back in the day here at the school, they used to run uh, an LMS system called Blackboard. When I first started here, we run Blackboard 6, then it was Blackboard 7. And when it went from 6 to 7, there was database structure changes because they added features. That means there's changes to the structure. So this is a database redesign. So they take a database, they migrate it to a new structure, and you re reverse engineer, you rebuild, you add new features. And you do it properly and you do the design process. That's the redesign. As in other words, you're taking what you have, 
you do an iteration of it, you improve it, you add to it. And the structured design life cycle. So in the, your other courses, you're going to learn about the SDLC, software development life cycle. In other words, what is the soft life cycle for when you develop software? Database has something similar. It has a circular pattern to itself. So you start at the top, which is where you assess the needs. You determine what do we need? And you talk to the users, you talk to the stakeholders, you determine your needs. You analyze the feasibility as in, is this something that we can actually do? Can we actually collect all this information that we want? How can we do it? And then you come up with some alternatives because maybe you can find something out there that's 90% done and you can tell that 10% of people's wishes to just go fly a kite. Instead of spending a year of engineering time, it might be cheaper to spend $15,000 to buy an off-the-shelf product because programmers are not $15,000 a year under the best circumstances. Um, at least not in North America, they're not. So you look at the different alternatives and this could include, okay, this is an alternative that we can buy. This is what we're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. This is what it's going to give us. You, you do an assessment of it. You decide which one's the right solution. And then you do a design, you develop it, do some testing, you roll it out, which is called implementation. After it's implemented, then you do some evaluation after people use it for a while. What are they missing? What do they need? What are they not happy about? You then do an assessment of those needs and you go around the circle again, over and over and over again. It never stops. At least not in a good shop, not in a good business. It should never stop in a good business. A lot of businesses just stop like here. <laughs> they go, there you go, have fun. Who cares if the uh, doors don't close properly on our car and uh, you have to press a button on a screen to turn on your wipers? Tesla, right? Implement and they don't evaluate whether or not it's a good idea. And so this is the cycle. And the other, the other way is the waterfall view. So you'll hear people use the cycle. You'll talk, hear some people talk about the waterfall approach. They're the exact same thing. Except for going around and around and around, this one just goes down like this. And then when you're done, you climb the ladder and you go back up to the top and you start over again. It's the exact same thing. Okay. So towards this is the end, and we ended on good time. Um, so I will tell you guys what chapters you should be reading in the book. The tests are based on the slide decks, just so you know, and the hybrids, not directly from the textbook. But the textbook will round out what I'm teaching. The slides are based on the textbook. But obviously, the textbook has, you know, 25 pages for my 30 slides. Um, the hybrid tasks are going to get published. I will put what you guys are supposed to be doing in the announcements. Um, and make sure you keep an eye on your stuff and get your assessments done when they're due. Okay, so if all goes well, every week we're going to end about this time. So normally my lectures are about an hour and a half. You'll notice I don't take a break after an hour because I'd rather finish half an hour earlier and let everybody, I don't know, you guys have a class after this? I'd rather you guys go home. I got another class after. I'm here till nine tonight. So, you know, I'd rather you guys go home and rest than make you guys take a 15 minute, like I'm going to say, it's a five minute break and you know what? Nobody's going to come back for 20 minutes. And then we're running right to the end of the, right to seven o'clock. So I'd rather end a little earlier. So the good news is because we're not losing any lectures this, this term, we should be able to finish most lectures after about an hour and a half. And that's it, folks. I will be posting an announcement. I, I will tell you guys what you need to read in the announcement. So I will be sending out an announcement probably later tonight that will show you guys what you need to read, work you have to do, when things are due. It's a block of information. I send it out once a week. 